I don't know how many days Porchlight has been in business, but Boswell has been in business for 4,701. I think officially Porchlight many, many years longer. <laughs> um, but uh, this is so such a wonderful program opportunity for us. Um, the first collaboration between a Boswell Book Company and Porchlight Book Company. And um, the uh, managing director, Sally Halderson, um, is here to do a wonderful uh, interview with Catherine May, uh, who is the author of, I'm not going to talk about them, I'm leaving that Sally, but I'm just gonna say two <laughs> incredibly popular books at Boswell and indie bookstores all over the United States and other countries like Sweden. Um, <laughs> I, may I introduce you? Thank you both for coming. Here is uh, Sally Halderson. Thank you, Daniel. We are so excited um, and we thank everyone in attendance for um, this attending this new launch and joining our conversation with Catherine May. And um, Catherine May is joining us from Sweden, is the author of Wintering and the Electricity of Every Living Thing. In 2015, Catherine May set out to trek the 630 mile Southwest Coast path before she turned 40. During this venture, she sought many things beyond an exploration of her beloved English coastline, time alone, a vigorous challenge, the quietude of nature, but also to come to terms with why her experience of living in the world seemed so different from those around her and whether the answer to that question lay in pursuing and accepting a diagnosis of autism. She documents this journey in her new book, The Electricity of Every Living Thing. Catherine, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. This is lovely. Um, I am so delighted to meet you. Um, as I wrote to a friend who may be tuning in here, I'm hoping to keep my fangirling under control during this interview <laughs> <laughs> because I don't think it's an overstatement to say that your books have, have impacted my life in a really significant way. Um, and you've provided me, I know, and probably um, everyone who has read them with some improved coping mechanisms for life, um, modern life. And um, so I just first want to thank you for writing these books and for gifting them to us. Oh, thank you. That's such a generous thing to say. I just never stop being thrilled that I can make contact with other people in that way. It's just a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Thank you. Um, so I could go on, especially um, like one-on-one -on -one with you over a gin and tonic, which is also my favorite cocktail. Um, but today is about you and highlighting your excellent and important work. Um, Catherine will now read for us, I believe, mm. an excerpt mm. um, from your new book. I, is it, do we have the electricity of every living thing today? We have yep. it here. And uh, that I was carried it over to Sweden. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> and um, so I we'll to, oh, cede the floor to you for a moment. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to read something from the beginning of Electricity of Every Living Thing, which really sets up how I ended up writing the book and how I ended up undertaking the walk, because um, it didn't begin as a book about autism. Uh, it began as a book about feeling very dislocated in the middle section of my life. I don't know what changed then to get me here. A few things shifted in my mind, I suppose. Something about being nearly 38 and my brow line suddenly sagging to meet my eyelids. Something about the stiffening of my limbs and the thickening of my middle. Something about the feeling that I'm probably now halfway through my life, that time is running out that it's now or never. Other things too. We went to Devon in July and visited Garra Rock, which sits above my favorite beach in the world. For the first time, we stayed in the cafe at the top instead of taking the steep path down to the cove itself. It was just easier to do that than to schlep all the way down there. I was ashamed of myself, but also exhausted, lazy, and a little reluctant to carry a toddler back up to the, at the end of the afternoon. I was worried about the possibility of sunburn and about my inappropriate footwear. Even so, sitting under glass and eating scones and jam, I knew I'd lost ground. When I had Bert, I dreamed of giving him something different from this. Long days camped out on the beach, sleeping in the car on the way home 
growing up to crave the seaside like I do, but perhaps being robust enough to cope with the sand and the breaking of routines. I couldn't understand why I, why I was unable to deliver this. Like so many things since he'd been born, there was an invisible barrier between what I intended to achieve and what I was able to do in practice. Nevertheless, we finished our cakes and our tea and decided to go home. As we began to walk back to the car park, Bert turned to face the extraordinary view, narrowed his eyes and started to sing. All the clouds are in the sky and the wind, the wind, the wind to blow us away. I've told everyone I know about that moment and they all say, yes, they do make up funny little songs when they're that age. But to me, it was more than that. My little boy, all three and a quarter years of him, gazed out at the sea and reflected my own thoughts back at me. The clouds, the sky, the wind, the simple awe of those things. I didn't know he was capable of feeling such wonder. I always regret doing that because I have to sing halfway through, but it preserves the song in my mind every time I sing it because it was such a beautiful little song that he just made up on the spot. And uh, I quite like sharing it with all of you. <laughs> it reminds me of in your previous book, Wintering, you do talk, uh, talk about a time when you were unable to sing and when you were yeah. able to find your voice through singing. And I think that that mm. is um, deeply meaningful that you get that moment to share it that way that was so that was so lovely yeah. I, I think we should all share our wobbly singing voices more often you know <laughs> I we shouldn't only sing perfectly we should we should give everyone permission to sing a song that is something that is um just one of the many gems and that uh, <laughs> my aforementioned aforementioned afore mentioned can't talk um coping mechanism. I think that that we have gleaned from your writing and, and your books is that there are any number of ways for us to um, embed ourselves in our experience a little more mm. elementally, um, yeah. if that's a word. I'm not sure it is. Yeah, but, um, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a word that comes up for me often when I'm reading your work is that there is, it calls back to the elemental, and I think that that's mm. very present in um, the electricity of every living thing. Um, oh, yeah. And so I have so many things to talk to you about, <laughs> um, but for any of our attendees, um, I'd like to just do a little contextual work here for a moment. And um, for anyone who's attending that hasn't had a chance to read your new book, or perhaps isn't familiar with your previous book, Wintering, um, and Daniel did hold these up, but wintering and the electricity of every living thing, if they are not on your bookshelf or on your device, they should be. Um, I want to start with a little context. Um, I'm certainly not the first person to comment on the remarkable timing of wintering being published just before the onset of the pandemic. In many ways, our two year global wintering. And I know that book has been a lifeline for me, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Um, it must have been quite unreal, a uh, quite unreal last two years for you. And since then, you have published *The Electricity of Every Living Thing*, which was originally written, written, and I believe set prior to wintering. So I'm wondering if you could walk us through a timeline of the two books and what the past mm. two years have been like for you. Yeah, sure. So *Wintering* uh, came out in uh, kind of a, a, in the March before. Uh, it came out in the United States. And so for me, that came out just before the pandemic. So I had this, this these few weeks before uh, the pandemic hit that people were talking about wintering as a book about something else entirely. Um, right. And since then it's been very pandemic associated. <laughs> uh, and, and Electricity of Every Living Thing came out two years before that in the UK. Um, and really, I when, when we were negotiating this book, Electricity Coming Out in America, I was quite insistent that we didn't promote it as a new book. I wanted it to be there in the way that it had been in the UK as like, oh, you've read, read Wintering and now you can go back to the origin myth almost, because I, I really feel that the more kind of stable wisdom that's in Wintering was forged in this book. And, and this is really the process of me getting there. 
and I couldn't have got to that point of acceptance without learning I was autistic and, and integrating that in the way that I do in electricity so yeah for me it's like uh they come in a very distinct order but maybe in America it's more like the Star Wars trilogy and you know we're going back to those first ones that that came beforehand now <laughs> um I did actually I I have had an interesting time as well reading the two of them together and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to ask, ask the question because it does feel like there was the the evolution that you um, sort of explore and lay out for us in mm -hmm. electricity um, that informs the concept of wintering which is less of an um, internal exploration than an external mm -hmm. missive to all of us who are in need of yeah. a map to guide us during dark times. As you mentioned, it was, it was set out to be a different kind of book than one that addresses mm -hmm. the, the demands of the pandemic, but I think it also so elegantly <laughs> responded to um, this yeah. time for so many. Yeah. And through that book, you're sort of leading the way rather than in the electricity of every living thing where you were actively finding your way. Is that yeah, that's a little a bit nice, how you yeah. Think? That's a lovely way to put it. And in fact, um, when I sat down to plan wintering, one of the things I was saying was like, I cannot write another personal book like electricity because it was grueling to write. It was really emotional and hard and full of really hard truths to digest. Um, and yet wintering did end up becoming quite personal too. And it, those personal things kind of snuck their way in there against my will really. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm obviously really glad they're there, but yeah, it was, it's a very, very vulnerable personal book that on one hand um, feels very, very, very particular to me. But on the other hand, I know that so many women have, you know, read it and realized they're autistic too. And I, you know, like that's a, it's a really, the reason it feels so personal is I think because I have been invisible to myself in my own culture for all of my life. Um, and as soon as I saw another person like me, I recognized that I was autistic too. And I know that other people do as well. So like that personal kind of, it does, it literally feels like pulling your guts out, writing a book like electricity. Um, but although it's hard and although the conversations that it opened up are sometimes hard I I'm very like honored to have done it in in a funny kind of a way um it's important work it's not easy work but it's important I um recall a line or two in wintering where you talk about um being someone who feels like they they should and can address the the darkness um, and that mm. it isn't always comfortable for people to do that. But yeah. I do think that that is the connecting thread between those of us who see ourselves um, in the books. As you said, mm -hmm. you sort of recognized yourself through um, yeah. someone else. And um, in, let's see if I can gracefully move into <laughs> this particular question, but in many, yeah, yeah, in many religions and cultures, naming ceremonies are a significant aspect of identity, whether it's the self, a day. Um, and I feel like both of your books are about naming within that mm -hmm. same ceremonial significance. In wintering, you name a state of being that happens to everyone. Um, we often call it something else, depression, grief, recovery, um, resilience maybe, um, and <laughs> yeah. name those states as episodes of wintering or requiring a learned wintering. And by doing that renaming or recasting, you're um, giving them, giving our, giving us agency and giving yourself mm. agency within that state, I think. Um, and through naming, we gain control over how we respond and cope with the uncontrollable. And then toward the end of electricity, you probe why you went looking for a diagnosis, why you feel compelled to obtain a name for how you exist in the world. Um, and in the book, you say it was convenient to name the thing, the label of ASD helps me make a better account of myself and to finally mirror 
find a mirror in which I can recognize my own face. And so I'm wondering if you see any similarity in the naming of wintering and then the previous um, learning to embrace a label yeah. or name for your own experience of being in the world. That's a lovely connection that I hadn't necessarily made, but yeah, the, the two acts derive the pa their power from the same place really. And of course there's a, um, there's kind of tradition in writing about magic in which, you know, when you can name the thing, you have power over it. You know, Ursula Le Grimm writes so beautifully about that. Um, yes, the naming is so important. And winter, the idea for wintering came when I realized I had a name for those periods. And, and that was like this very sudden, spontaneous realization that I could, I could name that very particular human experience that we weren't naming. Um, and electricity was about finding a name that I'd always needed and never knew I did. And, and then realizing that I'd been searching really hard for that name and that I'd gone through many, many processes, you know, like therapeutic processes, uh, like reading every self-help book, you know, trying to improve myself in all these different ways to cope better with everyday life. And what I was really seeking was a name for what I was. Um, and, I, and I remember saying as a child, you know, that I, I felt like an alien. I felt like a different kind of a person altogether. Um, and of course, everybody said, no, 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 you know, it's fine. Don't worry about that stuff. It was true. I was a different kind of a person. And I, and I needed, like, not, have, not having the ability to understand that and to put that into context was incredibly self-destructive and it and it really like it degrades your personhood because you have this strong sense that you are moving through the world differently and you're not allowed to acknowledge it and in fact what you you know you're under pressure to keep moving towards all those other people who feel so different to you and there's just this huge relief of having a name. There's a bit at the end of electricity where my psychiatrist says, it, you know, it's so funny because normally when I give people a diagnosis, they're upset by that. They hate the label. But autism, adult autism, everybody is delighted with it. <laughs> and it's really important to think about why that might be. And, and that's because we, we need to understand what we are. It's, it, and if you've never been denied that it's very hard to understand that I think that the understand the the depths of desperation you feel when you know you are not the same you mentioned um the word coping and I'm pretty I'm fascinated by as I have already said I I found coping mechanisms in uh wintering for some of the challenges that I felt with the pandemic and actually that explained a lot of my life to me just in general um and which we will probably get to but um i think the the question of coping and what is I don't know, healthy coping versus um survival coping is mm. a distinction that you're making in the electricity of every living thing and um i'm just i'm going to read a line here but early on in electricity during one of the first legs of your walk you write the sun was already past its peak when I left mine head, and now it is low in the sky, but warm and clear. I walk and walk. There is no sense of feeling guilty at this abundant solitude in turning back and heading home. I can only go forward. Forward is all I have. Mm -hmm. And um, the situation you put yourself in that you volunteered for in walking this very literal path and figurative, I suppose, demanded so much physically of you. And it seems to me that through walking, you walked yourself into capability and you coped with everything that the paths presented you with. And often they were <laughs> barely <laughs> with no, the weather came, the hills came, the mud came <laughs> and you coped. And then sort of the arc of the book follows where um, in, in one or in a middle passage, I think um, you talk about how might be a little earlier than that, but you talk about how you had always seen yourself as a capable person, as a person who coped, 
but maybe you hadn't been coping at all. And then by the end of the, the book, we get to a place where you are making, again, with the word agency, I suppose, making choices based on your own belief of your own capabilities, I guess. And I think most yeah. of us um, at some time or another feel desperately incapable of meeting the moment. Um, <laughs> yes. And <laughs> were you cognizant at the time that you were presenting yourself with a challenge you'd be forced to overcome? And through that mm. act of doing, teaching yourself to cope and challenging your capability, or did that kind of come yeah. after? I, I think I was a bit, you know, I, I like I didn't fully understand why I felt the need to walk. Um, I mean, the, the, the experience of walking itself was calling me, but I, I had this sense that I needed to do something that was really hard. Like, and I, I came to understand that what that did for me, doing something physically hard, kind of parked my brain while I'm, uh, like, uh, it, I was so tired all the time that my conscious brain couldn't meddle with stuff. And that process was really interesting because I'd never walked for so long before. And there was always this like moving through layers of experience as I walked. So I'd, you know, the first hour I'd be really uncomfortable and I'd be constantly like relacing my boots and there'd be a seam in something and my backpack was wrong and, you know, I'd be fiddling with the straps. And then I'd reach this quite kind of euphoric state where I was like, yeah, I'm out here and this is great. And I'd be full of all these bubbling ideas that were coming up and felt quite kind of lucid. But then, and I'm sure this is about depleted glycogen levels or something like that, <laughs> but you know, I would reach this point that was kind of beyond language, um, that where my brain felt quiet in a in a way that was actually so luxurious to me. Um, and I, I felt like I was just existing and it was hard. I mean, that was the bits when the walks were hard. You know, I was exhausted already and I was hauling myself up hills and trying to move from my skeleton just to keep walking rather than thinking about my muscles. Um, but they were also the moments looking back that huge insights dropped in like just landed like somebody had airdropped them and it I don't know what that place is I think it's similar to meditation in lots of ways mm -hmm. when meditation feels great but it was also different to even that and I yeah I I was seeking that experience without knowing how to seek it um, and it, it was almost like something atavistic you know like I was called to walk south I don't know there, there was something that, that told me that I just needed to, to move to the point of exhaustion which I'd never done before um, and yeah I I couldn't articulate it but it looks like it makes loads of sense now and I would now recommend it to anyone that was in a crisis or so <laughs> I do think that there is something I think diff a lot of people pursue um, or maybe as we age, we come to realize how separate from our bodies we've become and mm. that there is something both in electricity and in wintering that is very much about the integration of the body and the brain and how they are yeah. um, um, not metronome, I'm thinking metronomes for one another, but they set the rhythm oh, okay. for yeah, one yeah. another perhaps. Ooh, yeah. And yeah. in wintering, you you are also very physically present. I think when you're talking about mm. um, swimming in the sea, in a frigid sea or saunaing or being yeah. in the hot, um, the hot pools. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, is that what Yeah, the, uh, um, in the, the Blue Lagoon in Iceland. Yeah. yeah, and I think yeah. that there's something very, um, it makes, again, I come back to the word elemental, but it puts us back in our bodies and that it, we are so distracted by what's going on in our minds that there is a lesson of integration there. Yes, I, I mean, I, I don't know if this is about my autistic experience, but I do not feel like my mind and body are separate anyway. They are, right. I, and, and you know, I think that's true for everyone incidentally, but I think that you can't ignore it when you have a mind like mine that feels the detail of everything around you. And so, you either therefore please your senses and indulge them and 
challenge them in really good ways or you're in constant discomfort. And I, you know, like I know only too well that when I'm uncomfortable, which is often, that that completely clouds my brain over and that I can't think, uh, you know, that it feels like I, you know, I can't think at least. And walking, yeah, I mean, you, you talked about it being metronomic. That's an interesting word to use for walking because it is rhythmic actually. Mm-hmm. And there is something about that rhythm that, you know, and everyone has their own one. Like mine's quite fast. Like that, that frustrates a lot of writers about walking because it's quite fashionable to talk about slow walking. I walk quite <laughs> fast and I really like walking fast. Uh-huh. Like that's, I'm quite uncomfortable if I'm walking slowly. Um, but, you know, there's this need to find that rhythm. And of course, we don't walk that much anymore. We don't walk as part of our everyday conduct of of life um and I my body really needs to walk and it doesn't have much reason to unless I make it and I you know I have to find those reasons yeah um I'm I want to sort of double back to the pages that you read when we first began and um you talk about your son Bert and um in the opening of the book um even in the in the opening of wintering where um, your husband is sort of the main focus focal point to opening the book that there's something obviously um your life experience how you are in the world is so deeply connected to your family and how you Mm. relate or found it difficult to connect in the way that you wanted to and um in the opening of electricity you write um people carry electricity for me they have a current that surges around my body until i'm exhausted it makes the air feel thick like humanity has a texture it makes me feel like i can't breathe and i was thinking um that this intensity of feeling is something that you experience in your whole life but it seems to have become particularly untenable as you became a mother to be um experiencing that intensity and trying to make connection at the same time and there's Mm. you know a common self-care self-help encouragement that we hear often with women and mothers in particular though with you know everyone should consider this that we're told to put our own (laughs) oxygen mask on first like we yeah yeah. on on a plane right um parenthood certainly in my experience has forced me to step up to get sort of my interior house in order in order yeah. to be the best kind of parent for for my particular child. And for those who have yet to read your book, can you tell us how you came to realize that you processed life differently and then how that how you process life contrasted with the assumptions of motherhood and how you wish to be as a mother? Mm. I, you know, <sighs> I went in, you know, like you, you read my quote about being a coper, like I always saw myself as a coper, even if that wasn't entirely accurate. And I had imagined myself being an ultra competent mother, like I'm good with children as far as I was concerned. I'm organized, like I just, I thought this would be my wheelhouse, frankly. And I found very quickly that it wasn't like actually pregnancy itself was very hard for me because mm-hmm. I, you know, and now I look back and realize because I, because of sensory overwhelm and early motherhood is, is a, is a sandstorm. I mean, babies cry and they need to touch you a lot and other people are interfering with you a lot and your whole sensory landscape changes. And I, I couldn't cope with it initially. And I, like a, you know, I think it's even changed again, but certainly when Bert was a baby and in my town in particular, everybody was very into this kind of attachment parenting and there was real disapproval if you weren't carrying your baby in a papoose all the time and holding them all the time and never putting them down and breastfeeding until they were quite old compared to, you know, the age that maybe I was breastfed until. Um, And I, it was really clear to me that that was not the mode of parenting that I could cope with. Like I needed to put him down. And I actually began to realize that he liked it when I put him down too. Like he would be very fed up if I carried him around all the time. And then I'd lay him in his crib and he would settle. And and you could see the relief on his look face. Like, oh, this woman has stopped handling me. (laughs) And I, 
the, the crazy thing about us as humans is that rather than going, oh, this is the thing that works for us, like I can really see that we both like it this way. I thought, oh, we're failing, I'm failing, he's failing, like we're not doing this right. I need to, you know, I felt like I needed to hide from the other mothers. And like in some ways I did, people were quite disapproving, honestly, mm. about each other all the time. And I'm sure that still goes on. I'm sure we haven't come out, you know, overcome the point when women yeah. were terrible to each other about their, you know, mothering. Anyway, um, so I, you know, the, the, the answer to your question is that I, could perceive my own needs but I didn't I didn't uh, perceive them I resisted really perceiving them um and it was only later in the book that I realized how like how much pleasure I was getting from contact with my son in the way that I needed to do it and in a way that was really responsive to him too but we hadn't been allowed to think about it that way and yeah I mean I you know I talk about contact as being electric and I really you know genuinely feel that kind of current coming from people but his electricity feels just like mine like he's you know I've produced this little person who's got the same electricity and so touching him is not like touching strangers and we both know how to moderate that if we're allowed to do it and if we're allowed to meet our intuition about it and I I now think we're huggers you know <laughs> like, <laughs> now that it's on your own terms right now that it's on my own terms and his own terms you know and we don't trust mothers enough to do the thing that they know how to do and that's unique to them like we we write too many books about it and we make too many TV shows about it and we overblow like the rules. Um, and actually once I once I tuned into my intuition more, I definitely became a better mother. And I definitely became happier. It's that's so simple, isn't it? It's I wish it were that simple, but it is simple if you can allow yourself to do it. And I, it, you know, the book kind of tracks me getting it badly wrong and getting better <laughs> gradually. I, the, um, the subtitle of, and I don't know if this is the, I think this might be a different subtitle. Than, no, no, it's the same as the UK one, actually. Is it? Yeah. A yeah. woman's walk yeah. in the wild to find her way home. And I, I reference that because I don't want to give out any spoilers, right? We, we want <laughs> for anyone who hasn't read it. Um, but I am really fascinated by the, the story here about having to leave in order to come back home, like having mm -hmm. to, and you talk a lot about leaving, you talk about leaving um, parties, you talk about leaving situations <laughs> you, and um, that that was your coping mechanism as opposed mm -hmm. to finding ways to cope while staying. Yeah. And, I'd like to highlight one of my favorite passages um, and talk about it in relationship to home. Um, you write, so you, this is toward the end of electricity and, and you are on one of your short vacations with your family. Um, and one of the more successful ones toward the end of the book. <laughs> and you write, um, and you have you have set to you set this plan together. You're going to go do this um, particular um, go to this particular beach, and you um, it's not everything that you thought it was going to be. And you write a few moments later, the sun breaks loose and the sky turns bright blue, and we have the world's most perfect beach all to ourselves because we were willing to be there when it wasn't quite perfect yet. And yeah. um, I find this to be one of the most beautiful lines in the book, um, in a book full of beauty, um, because isn't this what home is? And home is about staying and sticking with it, even when it's not perfect. And yeah. the, um, I think that the, the lesson, if there, I don't know if you would <laughs> embrace the word lesson necessarily, is um, that, when we choose to stay and we learn ways to cope that are 
um, healthier ways than leaving, mm -hmm. then that opens you up to opportunities that you would have missed otherwise. And I feel like what you said just a few minutes ago about having learned that you and your son's electricity or your connection is similar <laughs> and the same, and you found ways to um, actually be in and do all of those things you were forcing yourself to do, but with this agency instead. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't, I find that to be um, in a world full of perfectionists and um, internal perfectionism that um, maybe the most beautiful things are found in imperfection. Mm, and oh, there's so much to say about that. But I, I, I think that when we're talking about family, like the greatest gift you can give to your family is to just stick around. Like there's no such thing as quality time. You know, <laughs> it's your presence is what's needed but that can be the hardest thing like that can just be a very slow patient boring act and full of frustrating things and conflicts and the i mean the sheer tedium of family life sometimes as well which i think makes us all want to escape to you know the world that we've always watched in sex in the city you know <laughs> um which i crave as much as anyone else but the the process of the book was about learning to stay and to stick around and to ride out the difficult bits and like i think that's really insightful about marriage as well uh, you know like i've been with my husband for nearly 25 years now um and the biggest lesson i've learned like i hear people talk such rubbish about romance and love and how it works like you just have to both be committed to stick, sticking around like you you just keep coming back and you keep coming mm -hmm. back when you're in conflict and you keep coming back when you're frustrated with each other and you keep coming back when you disagree uh and that's the that's the trick to all of it of course you have to have two of you consenting to that but uh, you know i think the book's about me and my husband a lot as well and mm -hmm. how we as two two quite awkward people actually um keep on coming back and sticking around because it's not about perfection you know it's not about those instagrammable relationships it's it's actually about two very very flawed people making a commitment to just turning up um and that sounds that's not the greatest thing to say on valentine's week and i'm sorry <laughs> to the whole valentine's marketing industry but my Valentine's card will be like, ah, oh, keep turning up. Sometimes it'll be lovely. Sometimes it'll be terrible. <laughs> um, this is going to, this will be a clunky transition. So be prepared. But one of the ways that, that um, writers talk about writing, how's that for, for a transition is to keep showing up on the page, right? Yeah. In that same yeah, way. Yeah. And yeah. Um, you mentioned, um, earlier when we were chatting that are you working on another book i have just finished a new book yeah that's very yeah. exciting um yeah and are you um in sort of i guess as a creative nonfiction writer are you staying in that i am um, yeah i i really i feel a lot like it is the direct successor to wintering and wintering was the direct successor to electricity i i, I mean i've written uh i've always been quite scattergun in my writing and my subject matter but i again i feel like i've stayed this time <laughs> <laughs> so yeah would you like me to tell you a bit about the new book i think yes, i can please. now yeah uh, it's called enchantment oh. um and it's about uh lovely i'm, I'm in yeah yeah it's about finding the quiet magic in the world amid this very exhausted brain foggy world that we've all stumbled our way into like zombies after two mm -hmm. long years of pandemic um so it's you know it's got a lot of the themes of wintering and electricity it's about awe. it's about the wild um but it's it's specifically about how we come to have this enduring like almost childlike relationship with the world that keeps sustaining us and keeps feeling magical um yeah i'm not That's very not, good at talking about it yet i'm not used to it yet <laughs> i i 
I can't imagine um, a better presentation. I am super excited for that. Um, <laughs> Got to wait a year. <laughs> that's the problem, right? Um, so when it comes to writing your own story and, and writing narrative, and I know you're a, you have previously been a creative writing instructor, so you've probably spent a lot of time thinking about narrative. And um, in wintering at the close of the book, you say that you wish that you could um, end the book with, with a bow at the end. Um, maybe enchantment will is just another sort of leg in in the narrative. Yeah. But then it's in still, it's still quite a bittersweet book, I think. Yeah. It, you know, I, I I don't do all out positivity. Um, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> okay that's Sorry. the connection point right um <laughs> and in every living in the electricity of every living thing you talk about how your diagnosis um shaped your life's narrative um mm -hmm. and you've been able to take your experience and and your pain and write these beautiful reflective books that aid others in their journey and i'm i'm just um this is probably going to be our last last question i have so many ah, more it's so fast. Um, but um in terms of connecting with your readers and um what you hope that they come away with um in your bravery of telling your own story which makes us braver as people when we read it and i think that's one of the <laughs> the greatest gifts and just wondering if you can talk a little bit about your connection with your readers mm. yeah because i like there is a there's a a thing that i don't know how to name that is the specific terror that memoirists feel in the weeks before their book comes out <laughs> it's you know like the writing i do is hugely vulnerable and it's deliberately so but it still often feels very exposing and what's incredible about that, and I, you know, I think what's an underestimated power of this internet age that we're so critical of um, is the, the level of connection you find with your readers when you put your work out there. And it, it's in, like I, when I think about narrative and when I teach narrative, I always talk about how active the reader is, like that's a really important point for me to make. And I always see it as a dialogue between the writer and the reader because the reader always brings to the text they're not just making an interpretation they they alter the text as they read it like they change it they edit they see their own story in it they you know they're they it's like a different pathway lights up through every book for every individual reader and i love that like i that is the bit of writing that excites me. I'm so disinterested in creating a stable static text that's that's exactly the same for everyone and like asserting the meaning of that. Um, I love that co-making that happens. Mm -hmm. And, but I have to say that more recently, as you know, more and more people have bought wintering, it's, it's harder and harder to, sustain all of the connections and so I'm you know I'm having to relearn my boundaries at the moment and that's quite painful for me because I have just always adored that sense of of connection and co-authoring and sharing mm -hmm. um so I'm having to yeah find new ways to to get my hit um <laughs> it's it's tricky uh, and it you know it, it, it leaves you vulnerable in different ways. I think if you carry on trying to look after everybody, which is like always my instinct and I, I need to make sure I don't do that. Um, but I, yeah, I think it's magical to feel that call and response um, and the way that that then changes the way I see everything. Um, I don't know how writers did it before now. Like it must, I can't, I can't imagine what it was like to write a book and send it out into the world and like what do you do like wait for two years for someone to maybe write you a letter like, like <laughs> what was that like like that's that must have been miserable <laughs> that's now, true I, that's true yeah I'm used to it being very instant and now I can write yep. a newsletter or you know if I want to <laughs> say something um yeah and that's that's a joy for me I love that 
That's wonderful. And I, I know, speaking of boundaries, that you do have a boundary on your time. Um, I do. Yes. We are lucky to have had you join us um, as you um, took a little time away from a party for yourself here um, in like Sweden. The most autistic behavior ever is <laughs> like leaving your own party, your own launch party to do a different event. <laughs> We will definitely let you um, either get away or um, get back. Um, but I just, I want to thank you for joining us, um, Catherine. And it was such a pleasure to speak with you. Um, oh, I want to you. thank all of the registrants who also joined yeah, us today hi, everyone. with this first collaboration. And there are links to buy the book and to buy both books. And um, they are, uh, they are a meaningful um, addition to our like lexicon of living, I think. And um, we are so appreciative. Wow, that's so lovely. Thank you. <laughs> I would love to continue to talk to you for hours. Um, <laughs> so maybe uh, when Enchantment comes out, we will be able to speak again. And maybe in person one day. I know. That Imagine. Could be. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how that goes. <laughs> no, I, it would be awkward, but we'd get our way through it, I reckon. <laughs> That's true. Well, take care. Good luck. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank Sweden, you so much. And, and we can't wait for everything you have left to share with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>